these lower vibrational emotions. They don't exist where we come from. They're just here. Um, things like jealousy and anxiety and anger and resentment and all these lower things that, you know, we wish we didn't have they're, they're, it We have it for a reason. It's a, it's an earth school and, you know, we're supposed to conquer those emotions and reject them um, in our own time. It, there's no such thing as time. The universe is in no hurry. Uh, there's no first, second, or third, you know, you know, prize. Um, we're just here to slowly, while in physical form, find our way back to our. I'm here with Bill Letson. Bill is a retired fire captain who had a near-death experience in 1994 while he was on duty. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really blessed to have you and excited to get this time with you. I am blessed to be had by you, Tia. This is wonderful. You have a you're doing you're doing the divine work in the world. Well, thank you. And you had a near death experience while on duty, um, giving, you know, you're, you're giving back to society. And then here you have this near death experience. Can you start there and tell us, I know you have, you have a lot to share, but let's start there with your near death experience and we'll go on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was a fireman. I was a engineer. I drove the fire engine in 1994 and promoted to captain later. Um, but yeah, I was driving, I was on a crew with, um, paramedics, and it was 19, it was 1994. And I looked this up the other day because somebody asked me. And it was um, a flu epidemic. It was an official epidemic. It was called the Beijing flu. And it exceeded the CDC's limits for an epidemic for two or three weeks in um, December and January. And there's a guy, his name is Bill Tortorella. And he was in the West at the same time. And he got this crazy flu and, you know, people around him were dropping and he's got a wonderful NDE. Um, but there's a, a lot of people that got this thing. And so we ran on a patient and, you know, with the hospitals were full of people and we ran on this lady and nobody could, uh, you know, our neighbors were saying she's in there. And so we kicked the door in, you know, fireman style and found her in a back bedroom and she was almost gone. She was circling the drain. And so we sprung into action and yeah, you know, as I got up to her head to put an oxygen mask on her, she sort of let out this sigh of relief because she, she knew help had arrived. And I took in her breath and I felt it go in. Um, and I was like, oh man, whatever she's got, I will have. And, and I did. Um, two days later, I was off duty. Two days later, I had slowly, um, slipped away, you know, dehydrated. My pulse was racing. It was like 150. Uh, my blood pressure, I couldn't get a pulse at my, um, at my wrist. So I knew my blood pressure was in the seventies. It was below 80. And, you know, you're not going to, you're, you're not going to be conscious very long with that kind of blood pressure. And so I called for help from my family and they figured out I needed an ambulance. And so everybody came and did a great job. Uh, got me in an ambulance, got uh, high flow IVs going and got to the hospital and the hospital was, the emergency room was full of people and there were kids there and older people and some of them were really hurting. And so, you know, I was 38 at the time. So I just, uh, I took like a back, um, a back seat to this, to the ER and, you know, kept filling up. And so that to get ahead of it, they went out and they gave, they prescribed everybody with the same, you know, something for nausea and something for um, pain. And I'd had a couple of IV bags by then. And they came in to, the nurse came in to give it. And I said, you know, I think I can just kind of slip out of here. I'm feeling way better. And, you know, we'll just keep some kind of therapy going. And uh, she said, nope, doctor's orders. And you can't, you're not going anywhere. And so she pushed it in the, you know, she was in a hurry and she pushed it into that um, injection port on the IV. And it, my wife said it was immediate. As soon as the plunger went down, you went down. And um, 
your eyes rolled back and you just fell back on the bed you were climbing out of to go home. And um, yeah, I just crashed and they freaked out. They came in and Narcan me a bunch of times. And uh, my wife said everything went crazy. And they, she said, she started writing everything down. And she said the highest blood pressure she heard was 40 over zero. So the system just, you know, tanked, but it didn't bottom out. And so um, they put me up in uh, intensive care and put a bunch of stuff on me that kept me going. And um, they couldn't get me back. Um, so this was about 3.30 in the afternoon. And sometime during that night, uh, you know, I was out cold for 12 or 13 hours, just gone. And um, my wife said, your blood pressure didn't come up at all for hours. And they were, you know, they were fearful that you, they, you know, put you in a coma or you wouldn't come back at all. And so I sat there for, uh, for that, all that time. And then sometime during that night, two or three in the morning or something, I peeled away from my body. Uh, and I found myself flying through, similar to behind you, just this field of stars, just these colored orbs, these colored balls. Um, they all had this energy to them. They were all different. They were all uh, just welcoming. And I was parading through them. And I was this, it felt like I'd been released from a hot, stuffy, dark closet. And I was this huge expanded um, cloud, this huge expanded balloon uh, of awareness or something. But I was absolutely still me. Um, I, I had the same um, sense of humor. And, you know, that's that voice in our head that, you know, we cruise around during the day and we're saying, well, yeah, I think I'll go get a sandwich. You know, that sort of um, mental chatter was everything was exactly the same. And it was a seamless, uh, flawless um, change. And I was just somewhere else. And I was something else. And, um, you know, a lot of, if you listen to a lot of indie ears, a lot of them don't even realize they died. They're, uh, they're just continuing on with uh, whatever they're being shown or, you know, wherever they're going. And it, so, you know, you and I are in the helpful business. So this is this is what people really worry about is this moment of death. And um, we just we just peel away. A lot of times we leave days before the body dies and we just peel away and we are done with our temporary um, character that we are playing and we play thousands of them. So yeah, I was flying through this star-filled realm and all of these stars were showering me with acceptance and love and joy and praise. And it was color and light. And, you know, it was this energy of love was flowing like music. Um, you know, all those things are separated out down here. But in our real world, they're all the same thing. Um, color and energy and music and flow. That's why music, you know, lights us up, you know, the right, the right groove, you know, just we got to dance or something. Um, it's part of us. So as I was flying along, I was like, the first thing I said was, man, what was that? That was, that was gnarly. Uh, this human thing. It was really tough and I, nothing was tough about my life it was a dream life a california surfer you know I, I wanted everything education wife um family career everything and but it was super gnarly because of what we're saddled with um these lower vibrational emotions they don't exist where we come from they're just here. Um, things like jealousy and anxiety and anger and resentment and all these lower things that, you know, we wish we didn't have. They're, they're, it, we have it for a reason. It's, a, it's an earth school and 
you know, we're supposed to conquer those emotions and reject them um, in our own time. That there's no such thing as time. The universe is in no hurry. Uh, there's no first, second, or third, you know, you know, prize. Um, we're just here to slowly, while in physical form, find our way back to our divine, uh, the divine being that we are. Um, so yeah, I was gonna, like, like, man, that was gnarly. That was, that place was rough. And as I cruised along, I, I said, how in the world did I believe I was this dude? How was I absolutely convinced that I was Bill? And I had all these, you know, I had all these relationships and all these likes and dislikes and all these judgments and, uh, you know, these categories of who I am and, uh, you know, who my bros are and, you know, what I don't like about the world. And all that stuff was gone. Um, all the whole thing was like it was a game. It was like we are playing a game. We're playing these roles and um and we're learning from these roles you know we set the whole thing up and uh, you know this higher version of us that we return to when we leave here um so this is what i'd say to people you know that there's a lot of conspiracy theories and there's a lot of oh they're after us and all this stuff well if there's a conspiracy you were at the head of the table when it was going down um because you put yourself, you put yourself into this temporary being that we are during these times, which are extremely hard. Um, so just a compliment, you know, there are only incredible, peaceful warrior souls that are in the earth right now. And, you know, a lot of them are lost and a lot of them are waking up. Some of them are waking up and that's just going to uh, continue to grow that waking up you know that light that's coming into the world again um so yeah don't waste your time with conspiracies or who's the boogeyman because you're in, you're at the driver's seat we don't realize it it's our intuition or our subconscious but we have names for it but there is a higher you that put the whole thing in motion just to see how much fun you can have um and none of it's real and nobody ever uh dies and there's no permanent damage ever done um we all go home everyone's there our pets our relatives our ancestors they're all there and we have a great wonderful chuckle over the whole thing so i didn't know any of this at the time so i was you know flying through these stars and i was like man i could do this forever you know these beautiful orbs are around and they obviously love me um and there are no problems and i was fl flying along um absolutely euphoric um absolutely ecstatically blissful and the only you know i've used this word this phrase every time i said a cosmic orgasm and um and i'm not trying to be cute but that's the only thing that comes close to um, that feeling, that feeling of well-being and joy and peace and belonging and, you know, everything is perfect and you're just grooving and you're loving it. So that's what I was doing. And uh, I knew that was home. I knew this was a heavenly realm. And as I cruised along, all of a sudden, everything changed and I was in another place. I was in this place. Um, it was like I was, I stepped through like a cellophane or something and I was in another dimension and I was in this like clinic. It was, uh, it was a solid place and it had, um, had beds and, um, tables and equipment and there was indirect lighting and, um, it was like a facility or a clinic or something. And right in front of me were these three little hooded guys and they were overjoyed to see me they were giggling and uh bouncing around and bumping into each other and um you know as i was 
focus came into this place and uh, realized these guys were in front of me and they were you know talking to me addressing me somehow and and they were saying things like well how was it what did you learn what can you tell us and they were uh just giggling had these big smiles on their face and they were like little munchkins and they um had little munchkin voices and they looked exactly like those um those beings in the movie communion uh where christopher walken is in this place and you know there's a there's a soundtrack on there that is fear inducing and it's it's well known that you know these certain tones can create create fear in us it just entrains us to go into a fearful emotional state but if you watch that movie if you really want to know what i saw if you watch that movie with the sound off and watch those little guys they're bouncing around in that place they're high-fiving him they're bumping into each other they're dancing um they're just these joyful little guys they don't have big smiles on their face and and you know i think it's a, supposed to be a horror movie um but the guys i had knew had just had these big smiles on their face and it was like i was being surrounded by puppies and uh they just loved me um, and so one of them came forward and he looked me up and down because I was just sitting there going, what, what the hell? And, um, he looked me up and down and then he turned to the other two guys and he goes, he doesn't remember us. And they all just really cracked up, uh, giggling uproariously and bouncing around. And, and I thought, God, and I said, or thought, or the, it means the same thing on the other side. And. I was like, well, guys, give me a, give me a second here. This is pretty strange for me. I'm, you know, trying to get this sorted out and they giggled even more. And, um, I wasn't fearful at all. I felt wonderful in their presence and, um, was really happy to be there. The, the first place, the heavenly realm was, you know, ecstatic bliss, just like honey was poured over my brain and it was continuously running through all my nerves and it, it was indescribable unstoppable bliss and then <clears throat> this second place i call it the in-between place was still blissful and it was cool and fun and light and there were no problems but it it was a step down from that heavenly place and uh so the guys were bouncing around and giggling and stuff and then there was this guy who was obviously in charge he was in the background and he was this tall i call him the tall wispy guy because he was like this spinning energy and he had this energy that was flowing off him like flames and you know i've called him a walking stick insect or a, or a sliver of uh you know like a stretched out gumby I've, I've tried my best to <laughs> to uh, recreate what I saw. But the best thing that I've seen is if you take a glass of water and spin it really fast and then look at it from the side and you'll see this, you know, this whirlpool, this, you know, vortex that's spinning and uh, like a sliver of, um, of a person. He had a big smile and bright eyes and he came forward and he, as he came forward he was like he was underwater and he was moving and then parts of him would separate and then they'd all catch up again and um it was incredibly bizarre that's we're not used to seeing uh beings like this but um yeah he's an energetic being um like we all are um we're, we're just you know in this physical and so it's it's very unusual for us to hear this but as he came forward, he was just chuckling. He was laughing and chuckling, and he was the most cheerful guy. And as he moved forward, his that spinning energy, that wispiness was, as he got closer to me, it sort of overtook me. And um, and my chest just like was expanding and my throat was clamping down. And I felt like I wanted to drop to my knees and cry uncontrollably from love. This being was nothing but love. And um, so he came forward and, you know, he 
he was chuckling. He didn't say too much. He was just very joyful. And the little guys were bouncing around giggling. And, you know, I, I sat and watched this for a while. And, uh, and then I was like, well, you know, are we going to review my life? You know, you, you know, you, you hear your life flashes before your eyes. This is goes back centuries. And, um, and he cracked up, you know, I said, do you guys want to get started with that part? Um, Cause you know, I wanted to check out of that facility and I wanted to, you know, get busy with the universe because it was just a, I mean, it's just a, a wonderful transition. Um, and I had no fear, I had no, no fear of where I was or what was out there. There's no such thing as fear, to be honest with you. Um, it's just something new is right around the corner in every moment. And, you know, that's why a lot of kids write in these comments, they're like, I don't want to live forever. And I don't, you know, I don't, th this is bad enough, this life. And, and the, the reality is there is no past. There is no uh, regret of something you did or didn't do. Or, and there is no future. There is no anxiety about the future or worry about what you're going to become or none of that exists. There's only a fresh new moment and every moment is full of high energy bliss. And that goes on, uh, that goes on forever. Um, so help, hopefully it helps with that whole thing with you know, people that have all, they're carrying a lot of emotional baggage. It's, it's a real thing. It's a real energy. So, uh, so yeah, I said, um, you guys want to get on with that, that whole life review thing. And, and the tall wispy guy, he just cracked up, he just cracked up and he was chuckling and he goes, sure, sure. Let's do that. How do you want to start? And so I said, all right, cool. And I started talking about my life. Um, not the profound version life review. Uh, I wasn't there to stay. I'm the only one who didn't realize that. And I was, for me, this was a show and tell. And uh, then I was to go back. But I didn't know that. So I was just yammering on about, you know, forest service jobs I wish I took. And there was another park service job that my wife wanted. We were going to live on an island by ourselves. She wanted that. And I wish I'd done that for her because, you know, we were in our 20s then. And now we're on almost in our 70s. And I can handle um, island life now. But what, then I was just this go-getter. You know, I just loved the fire service. And it was exciting and um, dangerous. I loved all that about it. So, yeah, I took a fire job and she missed out. So, and I told a few more stories and then the tall wispy guy, he just goes, all right, that's enough. Time to go back. Um, like picking a toddler uh, off the carpet and saying, we're going home. And I was, that blew me away. I was like, what? Dude, you gotta be kidding me. I am not going back there. That was completely out of the question, uh, going back and He's like, you got to, he goes, you know, come on, man, you got to go back. You got things to do and they're important. And, um, you know, it's funny because I started talking about this about seven or eight years ago. And then the last couple of years, this whole NDE stuff has gone nuts. And Tia, you and I talked before this, that how much um, anxiety is out there about, you know, how much help people like me are doing for the world. We're not unaware of it. And I can tell you going back to that, my NDE in the nineties, that is what he meant. Um, you've got things to do and they're important. And, um, and it's just awesome. It's awesome to be a part of this. A lot happened in between the nineties and, and now maybe we'll get to that, but um, it's just really cool to be a part of this and hopefully to uh, calm some people down that, you know, th there are no monsters. Um, the monsters are only in our head and 
you know, we came for the fear challenge. And when we go home, none of that goes with us. It stays here. And it's nothing but a joyful reunion. So uh, he says, yeah, you're going back. And, you know, I tried a few things. I told him, man, I was getting close to 40. I'm pretty much tapped out. And uh, he thought that was funny. And I told him my wife and my parents, you know, they'll be upset for a little while, but, you know, they'll come out of it. You know, they'll get over me. Uh, I, I won't be that missed. And he laughed at that. And then he said, okay, you're going back. And um, with that, the room just started to spin away, to come apart. And it was absolutely his intention. Um, and I think that he, I call him he as a separate entity, but I think he, it was, you know, a higher version of me. I think I'm a temporary um, soul, a temporary um, physical being. And he has thousands of us. And, um, and he, you know, he was my higher self and he, that's what all this love was about. He just loved me like a child. And, and I think a lot of this is, you know, religions are trying to tell this story of uh, a father figure and, a, you know, a son, a uh, material world son and, and this higher expansion, you know, that we continue to expand into this infinite eternal being that is everywhere. and. And I kind of, you know, I kind of experienced that when I said I was this huge expanded cloud that we are these infinite beings. So anyway, um, so yeah, he said, you're going back based on his intention. The room started coming apart. He started to spin away and he evaporated in front of me <clears throat> and I dropped away. I dropped in frequency. I dropped in, um, you know, how I felt about things. Uh, my, my vibration was dropping and, you know, it was, it also felt like a physical dropping, dropping in away, you know, like stepping off a cliff or something. And, you know, all of us wake up. Sometimes we wake up and we feel like we've just dropped. We've just fallen. And now we're, and you and I talked a little bit about we all soul travel at night when we um, sleep and we, we believe it's dreaming, but it's really in this energetic dimension that we come from where all things are possible. And that's why our dreams are so wild because we are creators and we can, you know, we make whatever we want in that realm, whatever we think about, it shows up immediately. And back here on earth, whatever we think about or we plan for or whatever, it takes us some days, weeks, months, even a lifetime to manifest, but we can we can create exactly what we set out to do. Um, so it's a uh, here it's a really slowed down version of where we are there. At home, everything's immediate. Uh, so uh, yeah, I dropped away, and then I got in this place where I was near my body, and it was a devastating feeling and i don't know if it's that you know that valley of the shadow of death that you know we try to explain is um you know this realm hell uh where these low vibrations are this, this place where lost souls ghosts um trying to get back into a body or something they hang out here because they lived this life and they had a low vibration and they're stuck for a while till they figure it out but being in that place, it was lonely and it was dismal and it was really heavy. And I think, you know, reintegrating with Bill and all of his baggage, you know, even though he seems like a really cool, friendly guy, but we all have it. We've got, got baggage. We all carry it. it. It's a real thing. It's a, it's an, an energetic entity. Um, so yeah, I'm loading all that back on. It was like having a dump truck back up and dump a load of gravel on you. You just felt completely devastated to come back into this place. Um, it's not your imagination. This place is gnarly. It's really hard. Uh, 
so I was back in my body and slowly woke up. Um, you know, I could see the the um, machines, what they were numbers they were putting out over some hours, and eventually my vitals just climbed back to where I was normal. And you know, I was kind of looking around, and a nurse walked by. It was still dark, you know, four or whatever in the morning, and she walked by and uh, she's like, "You're awake," and it was she was like really happy and i'm like yes i am i need to talk to you and because i was you know i was pissed <laughs> I, I i took me some time to get around to saying that but i was upset i was sad and i was devastated to be pulled away from all that joy and um She's like, I got to go get the doctor. We didn't know what was going on with you. We didn't know if you were going to get back or, you know, how did you get so far gone? And, and I'm like, yeah, okay, that's cool. You can go get the doctor. But first, what am I doing back here? Um, as if she had an answer. But um, she was a, an old nurse, kind, and she, you know, I told her, I go, I was dead. Bill, I was, Bill was dead and I was gone. And um, I had bought the farm. I was sure of it. How did I get back here? And nurses are pretty clever. And she said, uh, honey, you've been in escrow, but you fell out of escrow and now you're back with us. And she looked me eye to eye, you know, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And she said, you need to get your head around that. And that sunk in immediately. And I was really lucky with that because most indie ears don't have that where, you know, I was, I was this freewheeling, incredibly ecstatic soul for whatever time. And suddenly I was, you know, stuffed back into this place. This, this is why babies come out and they're crying. Um, this is a devastating, devastatingly heavy arrival. And, um, a lot of indie ears, you know, they don't come out of it for months or years. And, you know, then they addictions creeps in because they're trying to escape again. And, um, you know, you'll lose, you know, 10 or 20 years um, with this whole thing. But I, I dodged that. And she told me, you're, you're back, you're Bill again, and you need to get your head around that. And uh, that's, that sunk in. I was real, I'm real grateful for that. Um, because, you know, eventually these guys, we all learn and that's what, that's what the yogis will tell you. And the masters, spiritual masters, they'll, they'll say, after you have an experience like that, get back in your life and chop wood and carry water, which means do the daily grind and keep your life going because you know, you were sent here, you're, you're on a mission, um, to experience things and get back out there and support your physical, this physical life and have those experiences, face those challenges. That's, you know, what you came for. It's a huge gift. It's a great ride. It's like an amusement park ride. Um, it's like going to here is like going through the spook house, you know, get through the spook house without breaking out. Um, so, yeah, that's how that went. And, um, you know, I was on the couch for a few days. I was pretty sad um, for a bit of that, really sad. And when I got back to work, all the guys were like, dude, what, what happened in the hospital? Everyone's talking about, because there was a bunch of guys, you know, that f uh, came to the hospital and followed me through the whole process. Uh, you know, like, that's like what military guys do. And and they're like, everyone's talking about you. you went through this thing. And when you came out of it, you're talking all telling you all this story. And, and, I, and as soon as I came out, I told the story. Um, I told it to the doctors and they laughed and I told it to my family and they cried. And I <laughs> told it to, and when I got back to work, I told it to everybody uh, that asked. And, you know, after a couple of weeks, you know, that that's like a red light, uh, a flashing red light in the fire department. It's like, okay, we got a guy that's on the verge of being a certifiable kook. Um, 
So the word kind of leaked down from the chief's office that, you know, put that story away. And, and I immediately got it. I'm like, yeah, I get it. You know, nobody's talking about stuff like this. Uh, and if they are, they're certainly not talking about short little hooded guys and a tall wispy guy um, that look like a, you know, a, a funnel, a spinning, you know, whirlpool of water. That's what he looked like. So, um, so yeah, I, I got back into character and uh, for the next 15 years, I uh, kept it quiet. If, if somebody was having a problem, you know, somebody would say, hey, talk to Letson. You know, the, they're losing their wife or a child is close to death or something like that. They would say, go talk to Letson. He had something happen. And, um, and I would always calm them right down. It's like, there we never lose anybody. We never lose anybody. We're just playing these parts and we're having, you know, a hell of a time. We're having a great, great lessons. And um, so that's how it went. Yeah. And I, and I retired in 2010 and then this whole thing came flooding back um, about looking into this and that goes in a whole nother direction. You and I were talking earlier before we started recording about some of the priceless lessons that you learned from the other side. Um, can you tell us how this has impacted your life and how do you look at life differently? What have you brought from the other side to share besides just the remarkable story, which is in itself miraculous? Yeah, I am. Um... So I'll just give you the quick version. Uh, in 2010, um, you know, I was a happy retired guy. In 2011, 2012, um, you know, I, I read this. I watched a video by Rick Straussman called DMT, the Spirit Molecule. And, and then I got the book, which I've never done before. And when I read the book, I got to chapter 13 and 14 called Contact Through the Veil. And what Straussman was doing was he was mimicking the action of the pineal gland. We all have this third eye and the pineal gland makes DMT, uh, dimethyltryptamine. And that does, you know, that's a lot for all of us. When we go to sleep at night, it drops a little bit on our brain and we leave our body and we soul travel and we have dreams and we go into REM sleep. This is when we're traveling and with the rapid eye movement. And, and so what he was doing was with the University of New Mexico, he did this experiments on 400 volunteers where he gave them high dose DMT, um, mimicking what the pineal gland does at death. Um, the pineal gland, like I said, it drops a little bit at night and we soul travel. And when we die, it just dumps a whole load on our brain there's splashes of brain with dmt and the soul is rocketed the consciousness is rocketed out of the body or inward uh wherever we go uh we go and um in his volunteers you know he has a summation um chapter of what they reported and they were going to these this clinic and they were seeing these short, little, joyful, playful guys and a taller guy that seemed to be in charge um, showed up a little bit later and they said it was joyful and it was fun and they enjoyed being there and it was immediate. You know, it's like you step out of this dimension and you're in that other place. Um, and that was my near-death experience. Uh, but, you know, I had this thing where I got uh, really ill and uh, got close to death and I left my body. But there was no DMT involved. Um, it happened naturally. And that's what the near-death experiencers um, are all about. And just to throw this out there, the... the um, all the great researchers that I've heard, you know, uh, like um, Graham Hancock and a few others, they say, if you want to know, if you want to understand what's really happening in the universe, talk to the near-death experiencers, uh, talk to the shamans, the shamanic 
you know, healing medicine guys and talk to those deep meditators like Robert Monroe and Edgar Casey, who can go, you know, and like the swamis and the um, gurus where they can get so quiet and so still that they can leave their body. And all of these things have to do with this DMT thing. So, um, so those are the big groups, the near death experiencer, the shamanic medicine people, and the super meditators where you go into a deep trance, um, where the vibrations start and, you know, you start moving. I do this all the time. I, I have these chairs behind me. I'll take a nap after I'm done and I just kind of let go and the colors start and then you'll hit the grids and then you just let go further and you go through the grids and there are these light beings. I call them ancestors and pets uh, and they're all around you. And sometimes they'll step right out of this light form and it's like, oh gosh, there's that, you know, that old captain I used to work with. He died a couple of years ago and, and he's young and he's totally happy. And he's, you know, this is hap this happens to me all the time and it, it can happen to all of us. Um, and it is, it, you know, meditation is not, I've always resisted it. I've never taken a class in it, but all I can say is that if you sit still in nature, um, Everybody can achieve this, um, you know, travel to these other realms. It's it's our birthright to where we come from. So, uh, so yeah, I read that book, and then I started going to Costa Rica in right at 2012, 2013, um, and I was traveling a lot. I was leaving for months at a time, and for the next three or four years, everybody was mad. My wife going to divorce me and all this stuff but i was being drawn um to look at these things and i drank ayahuasca a few times that it's uh, an amazing thing um i don't recommend it because when you take dmt you're going through a doorway you're going into a room you haven't been invited into and i think that's a really good saying that came from alex ferrari and that's a really good uh thing um because a lot of these DMT uh, volunteers, they, as they were moving around in these other realms, they were hearing things from these goddesses and things that were saying things like, you're doing it wrong, or you're not supposed to be here. Um, and they can tell by your energetic signature, you know, your energy is telling the universe, you know, how advanced are you? And you don't fit into certain places, but all of a sudden you're there. You, you've yanked yourself out of your body and you're put into this other dimension. And so, yeah, the, I think the best way to do it is you don't want to have a near-death experience and you don't want to go into a room you're not invited into. But meditation, um, sitting still, you know, detoxing and unplugging and calming yourself down, um, we can all get there. So, yeah, that was my story. And, you know, I did the, ayahuasca a few times 2014 2015 and then i kept going for another couple of years and i you know i followed i went to this place in, uh down in san juan hijo uh guanacaste costa rica it's called pachamama and it's a village and there are, you know it's just a bunch of international bohemians hippies and they live off the grid and they they eat organic food only you know um, things that are vibrant energy from the sun and uh, you know fruits and vegetables and salads and seeds um, and they spend a lot of time in silence and they have a lot of different programs for becoming silent becoming still and you know after going there a couple of years i wasn't really trying to accomplish anything i was just I just enjoyed it. I really uh, liked it. It was different. It was in the jungle and it was, you know, raw. And got this cat here tearing things up. And 
and so for me, uh, one of those trips, something just opened and, you know, I started seeing auras around people and, you know, if I sat with somebody, it only took a couple minutes, then, uh, all these other faces would show up in front of them. Um, and they weren't just pictures. They were, these were characters. These were animated beings that they had been before the past lives that are, um, carried, you know, as information on our soul. And I, I could see all of them. It was, uh, it was astounding. Um, I started seeing energy moving on the walls. Uh, and then in the sky, you know, the Aurora Borealis, um, you know, this swirling purple and green and, and then all these incredible colors that are under that. And, um, and I was getting a lot of, I was getting a lot of, um, static from my wife and I asked for help. You know, you can ask. They're all around us all the time and they'll help. And I said, can you guys help me out with her? You know, she's suffering so much. She's so frustrated. And when I woke up in the morning, I just said, Aurora Borealis out of nowhere. And I sat up and I said it again. So I went and found her and I said, Hey, sweetie, uh, what do you know about the Aurora Borealis? And she goes, oh, that is the coolest thing. I'd love to go do that. And I go, well, it's like a tourist thing, right? It's like a, and she goes, no, no, it's really cool. And I said, well, let's go. And so she made it happen. And two weeks later, we were at the Arctic Circle on dog sleds, uh, chasing the Aurora across the night sky and the frozen tundra. And we got underneath the Aurora and the guy said, and you know, it was these green lines that were going in different directions there. And the guy said, this is about to, this is a really spectacular thing that's about to happen. And he, he told us to lie down on this hill. And anyway, the whole sky just broke open, peeled open and these colors just came flooding down, pouring down. And it had a swishing sound to it and and I was really taken by that, you know, I was like, whoa, you know, I was kind of losing it. And I looked over at her and she was, you know, these little frozen tears were running down her cheeks. She was laying down and uh, I go, you okay? And she goes, what's happening? And uh, I said, what, this is an illusion we're in. And, you know, that's kind of the, you know, that's the movie that's being projected down. That's the information that's coming in. That's making up our world. And, um, She's like, I, I, she goes, I don't know what to do. She was crying. And so for the next two years, every day, she'd say, what was that? And I'd say that, you know, we're kind of the illusion and we're having fun here. We're in a movie. And that was the, you know, that was the movie uh, information coming in, just like looking back at the projector in the theater and seeing all the lights coming out of the little window. And um, I know it's not, none of it's believable, but uh, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And, you know, I'm not here to sell to anybody anything. Um, it actually makes a lot of sense when you say that. I never thought about that. I have heard of like a movie screen, you know, and there's a movie that plays on it. But now that you compare the Aurora Borealis to the actual projector and looking at the lights, it is very similar. <laughs> Yeah, if you go on Google and um, YouTube, I guess, and search for those, look for those really powerful displays where all the colors are coming and they're just shooting across the sky. And um, that just floored my wife. It was from every direction, horizon to horizon. It opened up and came down and, you know, we were supposed to, the guys were in the, sh in the shack and they were supposed to, you know, we we're supposed to saddle up and head back. And if you wanted to, you could pay extra and stay out there. And so I went and found the guys because my wife wouldn't leave. And and the guy, this Eskimo, this old guy, he goes, do you see what's going on out there, man? And I'm like, did I see what's going on out there? And it, he goes, he goes, nobody can explain that. And, um, and he goes, you want to stay? You want to pay extra and stay? I go, yeah, we want to, my wife's not leaving. And uh, so, yeah, so we hung out there for a while longer. And, and if you, you know, if people are thinking, you know, like I said, I'm, 
we were in our 60s and you rent the polar suits, you know, and you can walk around out there all night. You can lay in the snow. You never even get cold. It, it's that good. And um, so it's it's worth it. It's if you if you time it right, it's really worth it to get underneath that Aurora and check it out because you'll never be the same. <laughs> Is there a better time of the year than another to go? Yeah, there was there's December, January, I think that's when we went, December. And you know, my wife, she's the research is she's the excellent research person. And so she found this thing called the um was the University of Alaska had a site and it was projected when this aurora would be strong. And you want the aurora, you know, you want to be like five, six, seven and above in strength. And um, and if you're going to go somewhere, you know, call ahead because the the kids that are on the ground, they'll tell you they're because they're all Inuits, you know, and they'll say, yeah, we haven't seen anything in four months. And we got a big thing coming and this is a, you know, you got to plan it, plan it with the weather and with the energy of the Aurora that's projected and, and get the good warm gear. It's a blast. It's a, it's so cool. Sounds amazing. Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to add that to my bucket list. <laughs> I didn't even know that was something you could do. So thank you for the suggestion. Um, yeah. After all of your experiences, and all the things that have happened to you, all the wisdom that was bestowed upon you, are you afraid of death? No. No, I'm not afraid. The only thing I'm afraid of is not is missing an opportunity to help somebody else, uh, anybody else, even a stray dog. You know, we've got all these animals around here that uh, needed some love. And um, yeah, I just don't want to have an opportunity where I you know wasn't paying attention to where I could have helped um, some other living being because we just move on from here and you know it fades really fast but our our deeds stay with us we can relive, relive them as long as we want you know our best days we can relive that whole day we can change that day um, like I said there's nothing is impossible in the realm that we come from so, yeah, in actual, actuality, there is no death. Um, we, like, you know, we've come into this illusion and every day is a, a, has a, a fear underneath it that we're going to die, that we're not going to be here anymore. And, you know, that's the biggest part of the illusion is that. But we're always here. We, we change, we transform, we change our... Um, form and our perspective but like i said i was the same guy i was the same me uh i just wasn't bill and i was somewhere else that's as bad as it gets that's so lovely to think that we our loved ones and ourselves remain individuals do you think eventually we merge into one yeah we we are uh one we are all one as it is um we are just a little a speck of light from that being that we uh that higher self that eternal being that we all are we're just a speck of light down here in this earth plane learning all these lessons and you know we're we're supposed to come to this conclusion of uh joyfully being kind and um treating others with respect and being helpful and patient and sweet. And, you know, that is our vibration at home. And we, I think we have to uh, energetically earn our wings. We start vibrating at a higher frequency and we rise out of this place, this, you know, cycle of rebirth. Um, we don't have to come back. We do come back um, and we can come back, but we don't have to. We don't have any more to learn here. You got to go over there and experience some of the greatness, the amazing, the ineffable, um, but you had to come back. 
what would have happened, do you think, I know you can't tell me for a fact, but what do you think would have happened if you had gotten to stay? Oh, I would have just carried on in bliss. Um, as far as, you know, it, like I've always said that nothing was impossible in that realm. So whatever is in my head of what's next to experience, um, then that would be my next experience. And, you know, and it would, it would start immediately, just like our dreams. And, you know, there's a, this is just something that's really cool because, you know, after you, if you get tired of listening to my stuff, there's lots of messages like this and it's in our movies and our song lyrics and um, popular books. And my whole near-death experience was the Wizard of Oz. And, you know, Dorothy lives in this drab black and white place where we are here now. And, and you always hear near-death experiencers say it was more real than here. And, you know, an average person goes, what the hell does that mean? And, but that story is being told in the Wizard of Oz. Um, you know, Dorothy's in this black and white place and people are mean. They're trying to take her dog away from her and people are busy and, you know, all this. And here comes the twister, you know, the vortex. And um, she gets locked out of the cellar. So she goes into the house as the house gets hit with the twister and the window comes off and hits her in the head. And she falls down on the bed and this lighter version of her peels away in the movie. And from that point on, she is in a near-death experience. And she lands in this other place and she opens the door and it's full of these beautiful giant flowers and colors. And, you know, the music is flowing on the air and water is flowing on the ground. And there's all these giggling little munchkins around and they come at her in groups of three you know the lollipop guild those giggling playful almost mischievous dudes that is exactly what i met and you know the feeling you get watching that movie that is the feeling i had these guys are friendly and they're helpful and there's nothing scary or anything about them and so that place she's in, this land of Oz, where music and color and uh, everything is living and flowing, and it's all beautiful. And, and um, so that you can compare where she was to where she went. And that's what indie ears are trying to convey when they say it's more beautiful than I can describe. And, you know, for me, it continues, you know, Glenda shows up and she's this giant, beautiful orb she's got this purple and green and gold color to this orb that she arrives and she's really sweet to dorothy and you know the name dorothy means gift from god um meaning our lives here are a gift from god from heaven and so she um you know she talks very sweetly to dorothy and convinces her, the, you know, what she needs to do and gets her on her journey. And so she gets on the yellow brick road and she meets a guy who's looking for a brain and a tin man looking for a heart and a lion looking for courage. And, uh, and she goes on her way and to, you know, this absolutely is, makes perfect sense to me is that when we get control of our thoughts, when we choose our right brain, part of us that's connected to the divine, connected to home. When we make our decisions out of sweetness and kindness and creativity and flow with home, and when we live by the intelligence of our heart and proceed through our journey with courage, without fear, then we get to go home. And there's no place like home. And that is absolutely what that movie is about. <laughs> and so as a, you, you know, you're a near-death experiencer, um, podcast person, um, you know, that's, 
that's a powerful testament that there is creative people, creation in the world, delivering these messages, and they're there for us to follow when we're ready to hear it. And it's an endless list, you know, the matrix and the adjustment bureau and the unforgiven. I mean, a lot of these movies are actually, you know, scary movies. Um, like communion, but it's not, that's not a scary movie. Not to me. I, I, I think it's, it's like a home movie to me. Um, so there's that. It, and uh, one other one is um, one really good one to start with is uh, Groundhog Day. And, you know, Bill Murray's in that town and he's kind of an a-hole at the beginning. And each day that he's there, he, that's a new life. Every day is a new life and he gets to choose. Is he going to be the same old a-hole or is he going to grow? And it's totally up to him. You know, nobody's in the universe is in no hurry. There's no such thing as time. And he slowly learns. He spends his day helping others and being kind. And then at the end, he gets to leave. And, you know, and, you know, every morning he wakes up to this song, I Got You, Babe. And what that thing, is, what that is saying is, you know, we don't have a soul, like we all say. The soul has us. Um, we are this temporary character. And the soul, you know, we're, we're here for um, the soul's education and we are going to repeat the lesson as often as it takes for us to get it right. And it's really, it's really cool. It's really cool what we're going through here. It's awesome. And I think near death experiences are gifts from God as well. Like you said, our lives are gifts from God. Near death experiences are as well. And they give us little glimpses, like you said, into something we otherwise would have no access to. So, and not everybody gets to experience one. Like you were so blessed to have this amazing experience and to be able to bring that back to share with the world. And that's what I'm talking about. That's why I'm here. It's just a medium <laughs> to share all of your stories. Your story is fantastic. It's amazing. It's such a huge gift to the world. I want to get your take on and maybe maybe you don't know much about this movie, but I always think about the never ending story being a very spiritual movie also. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and that story that has a lot of strange looking beings in it. And that is something we need to get used to that um, you know, they aren't they aren't monsters or devils or demons that, like a lot of people want to say. They're just different. And it's an infinite amount of variability of what's alive. And it's in these, you know, like even the show, um, oh, what's that show with the, the mask singer and stuff? They come out in these bizarre costumes, you know, and uh, Vinny Tolman said, said this, and he's right. There is an infinite variability in what beings are. If you can imagine it, it exists. It already exists. And in that movie, The Never Ending Story, there's some pretty wild creatures. Um, absolutely correct. Um, and he has to go through three gates. And one of them is like facing himself. And they were saying that's the most difficult one. Most people run away screaming. And so that's, uh, that's one of the parts that always got me was that's a spiritual lesson, facing yourself. Yeah. Realizing who you yeah. really are. Yeah, that self thing, that is the, you know, un understanding or comprehending that this is a temporary life and that will peel away from it, but you don't die. But the person that you currently are, um, you leave them behind and your memory slowly fades. But that information is always kept and, you know, you can revisit them and, all this stuff, but it's not who we really are. And most people are not prepared to face that. And, um, 
you know, when you drink ayahuasca, that, you know, the higher self, the soul and the physical self, your comprehension um, opens up and you're bouncing between all of these perspectives. And that's why people are, it's like a big number, like 96% are freaked out, you know, run screaming back home and never go back. And because it is, you know, you're, you're ripped out that, um, you know, that the eternal you is pulled out of your current you and you look back, I look back at Bill and I said, man, what is his problem? He's creating so much, you know, because you're, you're in so much pain. You're trying to resist this whole thing of visiting these higher dimensions of who you are. This is ayahuasca. This is what goes on in an ayahuasca ceremony. I'm not recommending it at all. It's gnarly. Um, but yeah, you move through all these low, these higher levels of yourself and you can actually look back at your physical self and he is kicking and screaming and, you know, and creating all kinds of fear and it's ruining, you know, your whole evening is just, my whole evening was just disastrous with fear, rolling on the ground, drooling and moaning. And, and one of the shamans came over and says, you're going to have to find the courage to surrender to the softer you, the higher you. And when I did, it all went away. Um, it took 10 or 15 minutes, but I was in this waves of fear. It was unspeakable. And, you know, people do that in their lives. We do that in our lives with uh, our relationships and stuff. And, you know, I don't know, there's some value into realizing that you aren't your present self. And it's, there's a lot of, a lot to be gained by, um, helping others and being kind and, you know, taking a back seat and, um, you know, it's, it's powerful energy when you behave that way. The whole universe is watching. That's, that's what that movie, the Truman show, um, you know, the true man, everyone is watching. It was like, he was on a show, but you know, if I go outside and look in the blue sky, it's like glitter. It's all these divine beings that are, the universe is made up of this infinite divine beings consciousness. And they're all watching us all the time. We're wonderful entertainment and they're rooting for us. They're never judging us. They're rooting for us and uh, they want us to grow. Soul, grow in our soul growth. Um, which means our ability to love, grow in our capacity to love. Can they help us? Yeah, yeah, they can. You, you've got, you know, dozens of ancestors around. All of us do. They're around us all the time. And just talk to them, and talk to them from here, because this is that's the frequency they're on. Um, talk to them from your heart, and especially if you're trying to help someone else or. Or, you know, uh, relieve somebody's pain or something like that, and they come rushing in. But you just have to, you have to invite them. Do you have any last words of wisdom for my viewers? Yeah, um, it's really cool. The, N the NDE thing is going on right now. And uh, like I said earlier, there's three parts. There's the NDE, uh, which sees themselves beyond this world. And then there's the shamanic medicine, which you can do the same thing. It's like a forced NDE. Don't want to do it, I don't think, but maybe you do. And the other one is to sit quietly in nature and unplug and detox and fill yourself up with vibrant sunlight and structured water. And the divine you will come forward and your life will change. We're just separated uh, right now. You know, we have that big ball of sun in the sky. That's really a portal. It's a doorway home. We come from light. And we have a magnetic mother earth, you know, that we put your bare feet on her and soak up that magnetism and that electricity from the sun. And you just light up. You light up like a Christmas tree. 
Yeah, the near-death experience, we're talking about it now. DMT is in the future is going to be, you know, everyone's going to understand that is a, the key to the doorway. And the way to do it properly is this meditation to slow down and to tune in to who you really are. And that's where the world's, you know, we're climbing back to a silver age and a gold, golden age, um, you know, back to the times of Atlantis and what the ancients knew. And we're just beginning now. And people like you, Tia, are bringing the light back into the world. This phase we're in right now, the next couple thousand years, this is known as the age of heroes. And that's uh, those people that are stepping forward and tackling these uh, topics. These are the heroes. Hey, you're right there on top of that list right there, <laughs> Bill. And I can't, I can't end it now because you said the sun is a portal. So now, of course, I have to ask you, can you go a little bit deeper into that and tell us briefly, because I don't want to take up your entire <laughs> evening either, but briefly tell us about what that means, the sun being a portal. Well, you know, we talk about light, you know, we go into the light and, and to look for the light and to be the light. Well, the only light that's in our world is up there in the sky. Um, that passes over and the plants grow, you know, they reach their arms up to that, to that sun, that energy from home and their roots are dug into the magnetic earth. And that's, you know, they're, they're bringing that divine energy into our world. And then we, consume the, you know, the plants and the fruits and the fresh salads and greens. And, um, and that just lights us up and anything processed processed means the light has been removed. That's what it means. You know, this is all about that light, that sun, that, that we all come from. And so if you, you know, you're wondering about me, I sound a little different than most people. And, you know, we all carry that light within us and it sits at the base of our spine. And when we raise our vibration, however that means, um, with our thoughts and how we eat and our meditation time and things like that, then that light wakes up and it moves up through the spine, through the chakras, and it pushes out all that emotional garbage that's dragging us down, you know, relationship with your mother or, you know, that boyfriend or that girlfriend that broke your heart, all that stuff is r real in the energetic realm that we come from. That is, it's real entities and um, they really mess us up. Anyway, this light starts moving. It pushes all of that out. The chakra is clear and then it connects back home, back to the sun. And that is, you know, that's called Kundalini rising. And then there's this illumination, uh, this um, enlightenment, you know, it's all talking about light. And like I said, that big light in the sky, that's, that's our home. <laughs> you know, they, we can't have life on earth without the sun. We need it. If there was no sun, there would be no life. So it makes complete sense that it's our spiritual home as well. That's where our, our life comes from. Yeah. And I sound like a kook. You know, NASA's got the floor as far as that's a big ball of burning gas and all this stuff. It's it's not. It's an energetic being that is showering this place with love. We just have to return to it. I really love that. That makes a lot of sense. It resonates. Yeah, it makes us feel warm and it makes us feel happy, you know, to be in the sun. Bless you, Bill, for everything that you're doing. I know you're out there working hard to spread your story and to enlighten others and to just to share your gifts. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you, Tia. And bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy 
near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal, to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.